Alrighty, um, welcome this morning. I guess it's going to be a little cozy in here um, with all the people coming in. So um, my name is uh, Mark McLean, um, and um, this is Kyle Mastery. So um, just a little bit about me. Um, I'm a member of the technical committee, uh, core reviewer for Neutron, former PTL of Neutron, um, currently CTO of Aconda Inc. And I'll let you yeah. introduce you. And I'm Kyle Mastery. I'm currently the, the Neutron PTL. I'm also the chief technologist for open source networking at HP. So, all right, so let's kind of dive into Neutron 101, kind of what, you know, where are we headed today? Um, and then, so basically we're gonna cover like, you know, OpenStack Neutron, what is it? Um, you know, it is the OpenStack networking project. Um, and, you know, underneath it has a constellation of projects, which is kind of cool. We'll touch on some of those. Um, what are the open source implementations and the reference implementation? There are multiple open source backends, but we'll kind of cover what the reference architecture looks like. Um, some of the community initiatives regarding Neutron. And, you know, what's when the most recent release in Kilo and kind of take a little peek ahead to what's in the next release in Liberty. So, OpenStack. So, OpenStack. I thought we'd just kind of level set. I know everyone probably came uh, to the keynotes, but just to kind of level set. So OpenStack was a project founded in 2010. Uh, as of the Kilo release, we have 3,654 contributors contributing upstream into OpenStack projects. Uh, 10 projects in the integrated release, plus a larger ecosystem on StackForge, actually a pretty significantly large ecosystem on StackForge. Um, you know, production-ready cloud software, as you saw during the keynotes today, being deployed by, by a lot of different enterprises, a lot of different groups, a lot of people building applications on top. Uh, the latest release, the 11th release, was Kilo, which was just recently released. And it's licensed under the Apache 2 license. So I think we're, we're obligated to show this type of slide, just to level set everyone on what OpenStack is. I'm sure everyone's seen this before. Uh, so this is, you know, this is, this is a high-level overview of what it is that you can show people so conceptually they can see uh, what it is with compute, networking, storage, all the shared services underneath, the dashboard, things like that. So we're obviously going to talk about uh, OpenStack Neutron, the networking component today. So, and as we go through this, it's interesting to know what does the user see, right, through the GUI, through the CLI, through APIs or whatever. And, and the user is going to see the APIs. The tenants, in this case, are going to see APIs that they can use to interact with the system, whether it's compute, whether it's network, whether it's storage. Those are the APIs that the user is going to see. And of course, you know, these could be backed by something like KVM on the networking side. It could be the ML2 plugin. It could be something like Ceph on the storage side. But the point is the user doesn't see those technologies. They see the abstractions through the APIs. So, okay. So, once we take those basic APIs and we kind of dive into what exactly is OpenStack networking and Neutron, um, you know, we talked about the basics where you see KVM, um, ML2, you know, and you've got um, the basics. Um, also, the kind of level set because you take networking, you talk to non-networking people, all the networking people just start talking about L2, L3, you know, L7, what are the network layers? Just real quick, I'm not going to go into, you know, full discussion of OSI model, but basically, Layer two is basically a link layer, you know, um, the wires that connect everything. Layer three is basically IP, um, you know, V4, V6. And then layer seven, it's like we start getting application layers um, in between, you know, you get, but those are the different layers. When we talk about the numbers, you can, if you want to read more, there's lots of information on the web. So when we talk about the abstractions um, in Neutron, um, if you take a look at the orange boxes at the top, those are essentially the VMs controlled by Nova. Um, each of the virtual servers um, has a virtual interface, a VIF. That VIF is managed by Nova. Um, so it creates the VIF, um, but everything else below that going, going to the bottom of the slide is managed by Neutron. And so you have a layer two, you have a virtual network in Neutron that's a network that's one of the core resources in Neutron. Um, it's a layer two connectivity. Um, you have the virtual subnet. Um, in this case, it's 10, 10, 10, I mean, 10, 0, 0, 24. That's the layer three service. Um, you can also choose IPv6. And attached to that virtual network, you have a virtual port. Um, and so networks, ports, subnets, um, those are the three core resources that you will find in all Neutron deployments, regardless of which extensions are enabled or not. And then from there, Neutron's responsible for, you take a port, the VM has its VIF, and then you plug the VIF into the port, and now your VM has connectivity. So these are kind of the basic abstractions we have. Fortunately, we can use the Neutron API and do kind of elaborate setups like this, where you have a 
you have multiple tenants, you know, you have the orange tenant, you have the green tenant. Um, if you notice, they're using overlapping IP space. One of the features of Neutron is that you can have overlapping IP space. This is really helpful if you're, say, you're doing um, CID, uh, CI, CD pipelines. You want to do testing, you want to do configuration testing. Um, you can basically spin up a complete replicate, or replicate your entire environment, including down to IPs within, virtually within Neutron. Some of the design goals uh, when we set out to create Neutron um, is to have a unified API, to do network services via a uh, unified API. Um, provide a small core. The, one of the benefits for having a small core is that it's easy to have very compliant implementations because you have a very sur small surface area in which you have to match. But also have a pluggable open architecture. Um, we didn't want to dictate which type of technologies we were using because there's multiple ways in which you can provide layer two connectivity. So we wanted to have it pluggable and, have, and really empower deployers to have their choice um, for that back end, as well as extensible. You know, if we had a very small core API of, of ports and of networks, subnets, and ports, you know, how else do we expose higher level services? So extension, common extensions you'll find are, say, routing extension, um, security groups extension, um, load balancing and VPN, or some other extensible services, which we've layered on top of that very small core. So like I mentioned a little bit earlier, um, some of the common features you'll see are support for overlapping IPs. Um, that, that's one of the differences um, that you will find, as well as um, configuration support DHCP metadata services. Um, floating IP is a common feature that you'll find across all um, implementations. So floating IPs, if you're not familiar, basically gives you to have the ability to map a public, a, an address from the public range onto a particular instance and have it float around. Um, some people will also comment, refer to them as VIPs. But we specifically floating IPs are different than VIPs and Neutron, but sometimes the terminology will get confused. Security groups. Um, security groups basically protect the VIF on the hypervisor. Um, so we have support uh, for overlapping IPs, which is kind of nice. So that way, if you have different, uh, group, different tenants, can have rules which don't conflict with each other, even if the specific guests are running on the same hypervisor. Um, you can apply those security group rules both on for egress and ingress traffic. Um, egress is a little bit different. Nova doesn't support egress traffic. Neutron does. Um, they're fully IPv6 compliant. Um, as well as you can have security groups for different VIFs. So in a multi-tier architecture, you may have once on your uh, public network of a VM, you may have one set of security groups. And say accessing the database layer, you may have a different set of security groups rules. And one of the interesting things about security groups is it's a logical concept. So the actual implementation we leave up to the back end. So if some of the very smart back ends are able to offload the processing of security group rules and make it very efficient. Okay, so <clears throat> so next next we're going to talk a bit about the architecture of Neutron here. So so this is uh, this is a pretty easy to read, uh, nice implementation of what a typical OpenStack architecture would look like. So so which piece are we going to talk about? We're going to talk about uh, that piece right there. That's the networking piece. You can't really tell, but but that's it. So that's that, that's that's this. Okay, so what does a basic deployment of of Neutron look like? So it starts with the Neutron server. So the Neutron server is deployed, and this is where you know, the API layer lives. This is where the database layer lives, interacts with a database. You can see right there. So the next piece is you have a message queue. So this is where the, the Neutron server is going to interact with, with different components through this message queue. Uh, in this particular case, um, if you're using the current uh, kind of built-in reference implementation, you're going to end up with an L2 agent. And this could be either the OVS L2 agent or the Linux Bridge L2 agent uh, at this point. Uh, you're probably also going to need a DHCP agent. So that agent will exist somewhere. You can have multiple of these running. You can schedule networks, uh, different subnets to different ones of these DHCP agents. Uh, you're going to have an L3 agent if you're doing L3. So this is going to include things. Uh, if you're not using distributed virtual routing, the L3 agent will handle routing. It'll also handle floating IPs. Uh, and then, you know, you could have multiple of these as well, stacked, deployed in different uh, configurations. Uh, it's worth noting with the, the L3 agent, uh, we actually support uh, HA using VRRP as well, so you can, you can have uh, HA functionality for that. And if you're using DVR, we can actually offload the, the east-west routing down onto the hosts using OVS. Uh, and we can also handle uh, the DNAT down on the hosts. We still need uh, the L3 agent for, for SNAT. And then advanced services as well. 
These are things like uh, firewall, load balancing, and VPN at this point. So let's see what we have next here. Okay, so what does the Neutron server look like itself? So this is, this is kind of what the Neutron server looks like. Whoops, I wasn't sure. Yeah, no text on that one. But Okay, so this is what the Neutron server itself is composed of, right? You have a plug-in on the bottom, and then you have the REST API service, and you have the RPC service. It's, it's really, really that simple. This plugin can either be a monolithic core plugin, or it can be the ML2 plugin, which itself has mechanism drivers that can host multiple different technologies at the same time. And so what does a monolithic plugin look like? Uh, this is a monolithic plugin will have a full implementation of all the core resources inside of it itself. Um, so you can either do a proxy with this or you can do a direct control. Uh, meaning if you're doing a proxy, you maybe aren't even using the Neutron database, you're just proxying API calls across to something else. Um, so that, that's what that looks like. And what does the ML2 plugin look like? So the ML2 plugin looks like this. Uh, it's a full V2 plugin implementation. Uh, and it actually segregates um, the mechanisms from the types, and the types in this case we mean uh, types of segmentation, whether that's VLAN or different tunnel types, um, like VXLAN or GRE. Uh, and this will actually delegate all of the calls to the proper L2 drivers. Um, so with this, with this type of setup, you can actually run Linux Bridge and OVS at the same time. You can run drivers for physical switches with this as well. Uh, and ML2 will, will take care of, of working with those. So. Plugin extensions, I know Mark had alluded to this in the architecture slide as well, so we do allow for extensions to the API. Um, so you can add logical resources to extend the API. Um, things like security groups are actually extensions of the core API as well. Uh, so like it says right there, yeah, other things are, are the binding, DHCP, L3, uh, quotas, these are all implemented as extensions. Um, we also have the allowed address pairs, extra routes, and the metering API are extensions as well. L2 agent, okay. So the L2 agent, let's go into a little bit of detail on, on the L2 agent as we said. So, so the L2 agent actually runs on the hypervisor and it's gonna communicate back to Neutron uh, via an RPC layer at this point. And the L2 agent's main job is to watch and notify when devices are, are added and removed and it's gonna actually configure the networking on the host for that device. So whether that's Linux Bridge, in which case it's gonna use the BR kettle commands to set things up, or OVS, in which case it's gonna use the uh, things like OVS, VS Kettle, and things like that to configure the networking on the host for OVS. Uh, this is also uh, going to handle security group rules as well. So the L2 agent will handle setting up security group rules for, for the, those hosts as well. Um, so what is the Open vSwitch? Uh, the Open vSwitch uh, L2 agent uh, you know, works with Open vSwitch, you can see there, and it actually supports VLANs, GRE, and VXLAN networks as well. Let's see if this, uh, there's that. Yeah, it's using OVSDB down to talk to OVS to, to wire these things up um, this way. So, so the current, it's actually worth noting that the current OVS agent, the way that it works with the tunnel networks is it's, it actually configures two bridges on the host, and the tunnel networks are configured between the hosts. On the host itself, it actually uses local VLANs to segregate traffic, and those VLANs only have meaning on the host uh, that it's running on. And then it's gonna use RPC to talk northbound back to the Neutron server. So like we said, for isolation, this, these, these provide isolation uh, locally. You can use VLANs, you can use GRE. Um, you know, it's kind of whatever you want. We, we provide the capability. You can look at the trade-offs for the different uh, types of isolation that you want, what might work with your infrastructure. So how does tunneling work? If you assume all of those nice lettered boxes are hosts, uh, you know, we'll build a mesh of tunnel networks like this with the OVS uh, L2 agent. Um, and then we have these VMs. So the way that this works is we're sending, uh, so this is showing you that uh, pre previous to, to this L2 population, the way that this would work was we would essentially end up flooding broadcast traffic across to figure out where the other VM was. So then we have uh, L2 population was a feature which was implemented a couple of releases ago which is still supported and used. And it's a little bit more intelligent about building peer-to-peer uh, -peer tunnels this way. So L3 agents. Mm -hmm. So we talked about connectivity with the layer two agents. So layer three agents is where it's an extension that we added to Neutron. Um, and one of the primary building blocks of the layer three agent is we use, in reference implementation, we use Linux network namespaces. Um, we also use these whether you're using the plain agent that's running on the network node or you're running it within DVR. 
so basically, the Linux network namespace provides an isolated copy of the network stack. Um, you get, you know, the nice thing about it is you get your own private loopback because the IP stack's monolithic. Um, if you don't do this, so that way you can have overlapping IP addresses, which is very important for reusing them. Um, the scopes are limited to the namespaces. So if you see on our host, we, we have like our host namespace, we have the root namespace that has, you know, E0, ETH1, uh, BRN, because, and then you also have namespaces A and B, which also have the same devices, but they're actually different devices. Um, a lot of times what you can end up doing is creating a device like E0 in a namespace, and then plug it into a bridge or a switch in another namespace. Um, so in this case, we wired them t together, and so now we have explicit configure. You know, but it requires explicit configuration to connect them. Um, another one of the benefits is you can spawn processes within those namespaces. So if you're providing uh, routing functionality or forwarding, the process na the forwarding is separate for the names from one namespace to another. Or if you want to say have multiple DHCP servers that support overlapping IPs, you can, you can spawn that process. The process context will know which will be restricted to namespace. It's a really cool feature of the Linux kernel. So we talk about the L3 agent, um, and this is something you typically run on a network node. Um, it uses namespaces, typically will have the metadata agent enabled to provide metadata services if you're deploying it. And typically, you're going to provide one or more of the network nodes. Um, mainly, what, what we end up doing is you will place the logical router, we'll place it on one network node. If you have HA installed, we'll create a second namespace on another network node, use VRP to sync the states up between them, so that way you get HA um, support. Um, so typically, you know, how we're implementing it is, you know, like I said, isolated IP stacks. We're enable forwarding. Um, you know, this says just. Um, enabling IPv4 forwarding. One of the cool features about Kilo is v6 is fully supported as well, and you get basically static routing, so no dynamic routing that you would expect to find. Like BGP or OSPF is not currently supported um, in the um, reference implementation, as well as a proxy to the metadata service. So sitting a, in a level above that, um, and sorry. So this is how like the L3 agent is works. And so if, we, if you're running DVR with distributed virtual routing, we actually spawn little mini layer three agents on um, each of the hypervisors, which if you have a floating IP mapped, um, will handle mapping and doing the NAT for a floating IP for a specific instance. This gives you a higher north and south bandwidth out of a particular host, as well as it also improves east-west routing because we've, you're basically running routing in the host. Higher level services, we start talking about, you know, layer four through seven services. Um, some of the extensions we've, um, that we have available is load balancer service v2. Um, the version two of load balancer service is actually new in Kilo. Um, so if you've looked at it before, we've actually changed up some of the models. Um, they have slightly different attributes. It was really a cool community initiative that we've had over the last uh, year where multiple members of the community came together and said, hey, there's some things we need to fix in load balancing. So the community worked together, came up with some of the, with a new, with the revised design and worked through it and delivered it. So it's really cool. That, um, but basically for the reference implementation, you're gonna have, again, the network namespace. It's basically driver-based. Um, the agent talks to the driver via RPC. And the blue box is the namespace that you have running. Um, and the open source version, HA proxy is the process that we're using to do it. Um, and it allows you to provide basic load balancing services with HA proxy. Um, VPN of the service is very similar, um, except this time within the router namespace and the network node, you have the VPN, um, you have the VPN software running. Um, it uses OpenSwan, and they talk together. Uh, firewalls of service is an experimental service that we have, provides edge firewall services to the, um, to the logical network. Um, essentially, the firewall rules are applied and policies are applied at the router level at the agent node. And so, again, this is experimental, so, you know, we need, we need deployers to test it, to provide feedback and assist the team, and making sure it's ready in, in production. So. Okay. So, we just talked, we talked about kind of a high-level overview. Um, as you know, we just released Kilo, so I thought we'd take a look and see what we added, uh, what we added in Kilo. So, um, I think as we reiterated, um, there's a lot of plugins and drivers that can back Neutron. We explained kind of the default reference implementation, but there's a lot of other ones. So this, this is a count. So we added, that's a lot of drivers. It's really hard to see. But, but with the amount that we added in Kilo, we actually pushed over 50 plugins and drivers, um, both vendor-based and open source-based in Kilo. So it's, 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 a growing, it's a growing ecosystem. 
Um, and, and as you can see, we're, we're hitting a lot of different stuff. And in this case, you know, a lot of these, a lot of these were services plugins, whether it's VPN or LBAS or firewall. So we're adding a lot of uh, advanced service plugins now. I think that's because a lot of people have implemented L2 and L3 already. So now they're people that have uh, vendors or open source projects that have the capabilities to do these advanced services are, are integrating into Neutron at this point as well. Um, it's, also, it's also worth noting, I'd just like to spend a second to talk about, uh, about plug-in decomposition at this point that we did during the Kilo cycle. Um, previously, before Kilo, all of, these vendor, all of these drivers and plugins, they had all of their code inside uh, the Neutron source tree. So that's a, lot of, that's a lot of code, that's a lot of drivers to support. So we, we came up with this decomposition process which decomposed the bulk of, of the code, the back-end code for a lot of these, moved them out to a StackForge repository, and kept a small shim layer inside so they can still effectively ship with Neutron, with the OpenStack releases, um, but the back-end logic, which is specific to, to all of these things, and not just these, but the all 50 drivers and plugins, that's outside. So there's, there's actually a, a panel discussion later today where we'll kind of go into this in detail, but it's been a pretty successful thing for Neutron as a whole. And in fact, one other change we're making now in Liberty is we're actually bringing those backends back under the Neutron tent. Again, there's a, there's a talk on the whole change in the OpenStack governance model, so we like to think of this as the Neutron tent, where we're bringing these backends in as separate Git repositories, released separately, kind of owned still by, by whatever project, but they'll fall under the Neutron tent as well. So we're growing that ecosystem that way. Um, so let's see, in layer three, Layer three, we added some interesting new features. Uh, as Mark said, we have full IPv6 support now. So the team that's been working on that uh, got that done, and that, that's pretty exciting because I think a lot of people were interested in the IPv6 support. Um, so DVR now supports VLANs as well. Uh, DVR is the distributed virtual router functionality. Uh, in Juno, it only supported tunnel network types. Now it supports VLANs. Uh, and subnet pools. So subnet pools is actually an interesting API edition that I think we have a nice graphic to explain here. Do we? Yes, okay. So let's say you wanted to, so previously when you allocated a subnet, you had to actually pick the subnet addressing, the CIDR that you wanted. So we added this functionality called subnet pools, which, which allows you to specify a pool like this. And then what you can do, so the admin could create this subnet pool like this. And then when someone allocates a subnet, they can just specify the subnet pool and it will automatically allocate, um, it'll automatically allocate subnets. So you can, you can have your users basically allocating subnets and they don't have to worry about specific ones. They can just, uh, there we go. They can just allocate until it's full and I think we went too far there, but uh, that, that's the idea there. Let's see if we can go back to this. Three taps. Three taps, there it is, yeah. Okay, so that, that's, actually a really, that's actually a really handy field, uh, a really useful feature actually, um, because I think it removes a little bit of the stickiness for having to know exactly the addressing that you want. To, um, so you can actually take advantage of that in Kilo. Um, wait, did we go back? Yeah, that was a double slide, I think. So, uh, oh, did you want to talk about this real quick, the HPB or? Should we? Sure. Actually, well, we, okay, I can just cover this quick, yeah. So we had a new feature also in Kilo called hierarchical port binding. Um, I think that that diagram shows that. Uh, there's actually a talk later today on that, I think, right? Tomorrow. Tomorrow, tomorrow same time. Tomorrow, same time. There's a talk on the hierarchical port binding, so you can learn about that. Uh, port security for OVS. Um, so this, this was an important one. I think I'm gonna say it, it's an important one for NFV. The NFV people like this, because this allows you to disable um, the security group support uh, for OVS. So if you have, for example, uh, VMs that you, that you don't, so Neutron installs a bunch of default security group rules, this, this will allow you to, to disable that, so that's, that's handy there. Uh, we have some new API extensions, um, also NFV related, uh, MTU and VLAN transparency. So the MTU API extension, uh, allows you to, to specify the underlying MTU for the network. So if you know that your network supports jumbo frames or some, or if you want it to support a smaller MTU because you're using tunnel networks, you can do that. And if you're using the built-in DHCP agent, it will actually propagate that through the DHCP request. So your VMs, if they honor that, will actually get the lower MTU. Uh, and then we have VLAN transparency as well. This API attribute uh, is, uh, extension actually allows you to to specify that the underlying technology that you're using uh, can actually pass VLAN encoded frames. 
Um, that's all it does. It's not actually trunk ports to VMs, but it allows you to, to at least kind of get there a little bit. Um, what does it keep going? Oh, that's interesting. I guess we like this slide. It's a lot of <laughs> drivers and plugins. So, okay, so a look ahead to Liberty. Where are we going? What are we looking at in Liberty? Um, of course, we're going to be discussing that this week at the Design Summit a bit, but we've kind of got a rough high-level overview of what we'd like, and uh, that's, that's Liberty Saskatchewan, is yes. that it? Yes. First thing you hit when you Google for Liberty in, in Canada is Liberty Saskatchewan. So, so, so IPAM, so pluggable, pluggable IP address management. This was some work that was started during the, the Kilo cycle, and it never merged at the end. Uh, this is definitely something we're going to merge in Liberty and get there so we can... Uh, right now, Neutron provides its own default IPAM implementation. This will end up being pluggable, so we'll allow different IPAM management systems to plug in. I think this is a requested feature. A lot of enterprises have existing IPAM systems, so I think this will be a nice addition. Uh, BGP speaker support. Again, this has kind of been looked at off and on over the last year. I think we're going to look at, at merging that this time as well. That was kind of reliant on a bunch of work in the L3 agent that, that went on uh, during the, the Kilo cycle. So that work and refactoring is all done. Um, you know, we're looking at NFV enhancements, which are things like service function chaining, um, possibly enhanced security groups. There's actually a lot of uh, proposed blueprints at this point around enhancing security groups in, in various different ways. So I think those are some interesting things. Um, and then, you know, paying down technical debt, I think there's still some things there. For instance, we're going to look at doing uh, API, mic API micro versioning, which, which is what Nova recently did. Um, we're looking at possibly pulling all the extensions in so we don't have all of these extensions um, and we can make them core API attributes. I mean, you can't really do things without security groups and it's an extension, so this, it makes sense to pull that in. Uh, also, you know, we're, we're looking at uh, the WSGI layer again to see what we can do there. So we, that's kind of a lot of what we're looking ahead to. So this is just kind of, uh, if you need more information, uh, this is, uh, there's the document, that's, that's the great document that our documentation team works on there. Um, and then there's the, uh, the API reference as well, which includes the core attributes, uh, as well as all of the, the uh, documented extensions upstream as well. So I think, I think that's it. So I think we left a little bit of time for, we for questions. Yeah. So yeah, thank you. Does anybody have any questions? Um, I think there's a microphone. There is a microphone. If, if you stand. can't, if you can't get to it, we'll repeat the question. We'll repeat. Uh, yes, yes, we'll post the slides up the slide share. Definitely. Definitely. Any other questions? Yes. So, so the question was about the L3 agent with the, the HA functionality using VRRP. So, so, that, so the best place to look is, uh, is actually in the DevRef guide because it has a detailed, I think there's a detailed uh, description of how that works. But, uh, but, but at a high level, yeah, it's, just, it's using VRRP just to balance. So if one of them goes down, if you lose a node that has an L3 agent, um, it'll automatically fa fail over to the other one. So it provides some uh, redundancy. And I think it's... It's an important feature because even if you're using DVR, which distributes the routing functionality down, uh, you're still using an L3 agent for the, for the source NAT. So you, combining that with L3HA works well. And additionally, uh, contract D is actually running to sync the states yeah. between the two namespaces so that you have a consistent connection um, state database. Yeah. So, so the question was around the advanced services and the different vendors with their different support, maybe, and, and features. Right, so that's, so that's one of the things when you're coming up with a, with a common API like this. Um, initially, you might, have to, you might have to work it down to, to, to what's common between everything. So we allow the extensions, so you can add extended features if you have either vendor or open source features that you want to add. Yeah. Now, the, the downside to that is then if you're writing the APIs, you have to check to make sure that you have those extensions and things. So it's kind of a... 
but toss them there. Yeah, and also building upon the small kernel over time, you're seeing yeah. it. You're seeing you're seeing the community itself now. Out there with the new load balancing um, service has been um, with V2. They're able to build on in this cycle. We're going to focus on higher level features. So you know you get like they tail end finish SSL termination, layer yeah. seven load balancing, and seeing a more rich feature set. Um, so from the community side, you're going to start seeing common APIs developed for that as well as the extensions do exist that you mentioned. Yeah, definitely. And I think the other thing with the extensions are if, if, you, if you're using an extension and it turns out that it, that it ends up being really useful, you might see other drivers or plugins adopting that extension as well. Exactly. So it yep. kind of gives the users a chance to try that out. And over time with Neutron, that's what we've seen even with the Layer 2 and Layer 3 services. You typically have a vendor or two who's going to help pioneer and kind of help fill out the space, look at what the API looks like, and then over time it, you see more broad adop adoption that happened with security group support security or some of the other right. features that happen with. Right. I was going to ask, uh, who's working on OBS and the fact that the latency on OBS is really terrible? Is there a, what group is kind of responsible? So that's something that in our testing we haven't financials or mm -hmm. kind of care about latency? And it's one of many, many hundreds of Depend on what version. Who's maintaining OVS? Yeah, it's what? Who's maintaining OVS? Who's maintaining OVS? Yeah, yeah. yeah. So you, so like actually working on Open vSwitch itself? Well, I. Oh, I, I, I think that actually is a pretty vibrant community, and uh, not, I don't, it's a it's, separate open it, source project which has it, its own steering team. And so right. they have like IRC channels, they have right. um, mailing lists which they're constantly working on. Um, the one common thing we'll see about OVS though is, as Kyle mentioned. The version that people run with OVS, yes. that some of the um, distros will package specific versions of OVS. And so if you have a particularly old version, you may not get some of the newer enhancements, such as um, some of the caching of microflows, even yes. later to megaflows. And so they keep adding and making um, OpenV switch more performant. Um, so they're working on that, which is adding some support. And then even coming this summer, they're working on one of the things we'll be able to hopefully do is adding integration with... Uh, with uh, connection tracking, yeah. and so you'll actually will be able to get rid of the bridge, the basically the virtual hops we're putting in the hypervisor to apply security groups, and actually apply those rules directly in OVS, which will again improve you know the data path and, and, and kind of get rid of some of the bumps that we have along the way. Yeah. Um, but as far as that, I mean, it's a separately managed, very active community who you know there's. Open vSwitch is really cool how they're, what they're able to do and the things they're able to deliver over time. Yeah, absolutely, and they, you know, really receptive community for sure. And I was going to say two things. We, uh, so that 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 uh, connection tracking feature is actually there's a talk on that on Thursday, I think, um, as well. So that yeah, we're pretty excited about that. Uh, oh, sorry, uh, the gentleman back here had his hand up for a while. So I'll repeat the question and let you answer. Okay. Totally, totally set Sounds you good. up. Uh, so the question was is that um, there, right now, if you take a look at DNS and OpenStack, you have an overlap between Nova Networking, Designate, and Neutron in terms of and DHCP of like how, you, how do you get a host name, how does the resolving work, how does the reverse resolving work, and what service provides that? Now Kyle's going to give you a nice answer. <laughs> so yeah, I'll say that I think a lot of that is, is being discussed now, right? The Designate project owns DNS as a service right now. They're doing a great job with that as well. But I think like you said, you know, we can work to see how we can integrate that more. And I think the IPAM stuff can help with that a bit as well. And, but again, it's going to take you know, Nova, Neutron, and Designate, I think, working together yep. to, to really make that a seamless experience for you. Uh, oh, yeah, yes, the yes. Front, then, we'll then we'll go back. Yeah. How's so, the tooling keeping up with this development? So, things like monitoring, dynamic failover, alerting, all, all those kinds of things that we need to work on So, the question was around tooling and how it uh, monitoring, uh, detecting failure, and that sort of thing. Um, that, that's actually a good question. So. So for, for monitoring, I mean, we, we do support uh, things like Solometer, right? We have integration with that to provide that capability. Um, as far as the underlying tooling, so you're, are you interested in, like, the underlying implementations like OVS or Linux Bridge or those types of things, too? Or just... Up 
so yeah, in terms of what the monitoring tooling available for Neutron, um, essentially the tooling that exists now for your underlay is going to be the traditional tooling that you would use for monitoring underlay and monitoring your switches. Um, as far as keeping track of dynamically how Neutron's performing, um, right now there's no current, the community hasn't written a standard plugin for monitoring. Um, you know, that's obviously an area where people are very interested in that. We'd love to see contributions in that area. Um, so having the ability to monitor, having the ability to um, look into that is something, but in terms of basic reference implementation, now when you talk to some of the other, other implementations, either open source or proprietary, they do have add-ons for monitoring, failover, um, those very pieces. Um, as far as configuration drift, the agents themselves are constantly checking the database and validating that the logical config and the instantiated config actually match each other, so that if you have an operator goes in and changes the config underneath the hood, it's likely to get overwritten fairly quickly by the agents themselves. So we have time for two more yeah. questions. So uh, blue uh, shirt. And, yes. And yeah. then one over here. Yep. Yeah. So, so the question was around VLAN transparency and, and is there support for Neutron uh, understanding trunk ports to VMs? The answer is no, there isn't right now. Uh, that's something that we're going to be discussing uh, at the design summit. How we can maybe how we can maybe look at doing that in a way that works uh, as well. So not right now. Yeah. Um, and then those over here on the far far. Oh yeah. So the question was around the the shims for the drivers and plugins. So so there's no there's no requirement to have that to have that upstream. You can completely have your driver and plug-in wherever you want outside as well. It's just a matter of installing it and configuring the, the server to use that plug-in or, or that ML2 driver. Um, I think the advantage of the shims is that if you have the shim in, then your driver is released with the OpenStack releases, um, and it'll just pull in through, uh, through a requirement uh, whatever back-end logic you have, and, and so it'll go that way. So. I think that's, I think that's about it. So right. thank you very much. Thanks for coming, everyone. Yes.